You're watching Against the Tide TV, and uh, our guest today is an English professor, as I actually like to present uh, this very guest, um, uh, very much so. Uh, and uh, he's an English professor of public understanding of science at the University of Brighton. Now, we are going to talk about the Second World War, the out uh, outbreak of the war, and uh, and some Polish heroes. Why? Because the name of the professor is Sosabowski. Yes, you did hear me very well. Professor Hal Sosabowski, uh, the great grandson and the great um, uh, son of uh, um, of the, the General Sosabowski and uh, Major Sosabowski. Uh, it's not so nice to have you here. Well, the pleasure is all mine. Uh, I'm always happy, delighted, in fact, to talk about the general and the Dr. Major, uh, who's equally a hero in his own right. I, I know th that very well, as I have attended actually uh, at least two of your lectures uh, so far. Now, um, the 1st of September is a very important date in the Polish history. I was wondering, uh, do the British know um, that uh, on that very day, the Second World War uh, broke out? Um, it's an important date for Poles, but I, I don't think it's, it's not important for British, um, only because I think it, it was quite remote at that time. It was um, the British involvement only happened afterwards. But we'll talk, I think, later on in the interview about the, the attitude of, of the British establishment towards sort of Polish soldiers and Polish fighters, because this is an ongoing thing. But broadly, I think it's more armistice. The big thing is armistice day um, for the British. This is the end of wars rather than the beginning of them. Um, and that's the wars that, that they feel that they've fought. So in terms of um, pure British, I don't know that it is a particularly um, important day. The Poles in Britain, of course, that's a different matter. Um, it absolutely would be. And while we're at it, I, I, an English professor I am, but I hope our Polish viewers will forgive the fact that we're conducting the interview in English, uh, but I am a, a fortunate that I've been granted Polish citizenship. So um, I'd like to think that I become more Polish as I guess. How did the, the day and uh, the war itself, but I'm talking especially about the outbreak of the war, um, how did it influence your your ancestors, th their lives? Well, that's that's the thing is, um, first and foremost, the um, the, the general and the major, the general was the officer in charge of the children of Warsaw, the 21st children of Warsaw, and Stashinek was also there. And um, they um, they both fought. Uh, uh, Warsaw was taken, and um, they were both um, taken into the, I think, Zydorf prisoner of war camp. And they both escaped. They're not going to sit in a prisoner of war camp, of course. And for his fighting in uh, Warsaw, the general was awarded... He wasn't the general at the time, he was a colonel, I think. He was awarded his Virtuti Militari uh, directly for this. Uh, Julius Rommel awarded him this decoration. He then did a very roundabout route uh, to France via, I think it was via Iran, it was about via the Middle East almost. He was ordered to liaise with General Sikorsky and make a situation report on Warsaw, uh, after which he was ordered to get the abdical ship across to Plymouth from France, and then the British sent the Poles, 3,000 of them, up into Scotland. I think they sent them to Scotland because they didn't know what to do with them. They said, here's some colouring pencils, and here's some colouring books, go to Scotland, please, and stay out of trouble. And only later on, when my great-grandfather had to put together a parachute brigade, did the eyes look from London, think we need that resource uh, with our first airborne. Stashinek stayed in Warsaw. Um, he was um, Collegium A. Please forgive my massacre in the Polish language. He was um, the, the, uh, the officer in command of Collegium A. So he was um, in the AK. And um, on the fourth day of the Warsaw Uprising, he was shot by a sniper and he was hit here and by an explosive bullet and he lost his remaining eye. He'd already lost one eye to cancer when he was a young man. So he was taken to the, um, I think it was the St. Lazar Hospital and the SS started liquidating the patients. The Derlewanger Brigade, the, the penal brigade of the SS, and my granny Christina picked him up and carried him through the sewers. It sounds like a story, it sounds like a movie. This, In this case, 
the reality is more heroic than any movie can be written. And he was smuggled back to Great Britain. And he never got his sight back, of course. And after the war, he couldn't return to Poland. And he resumed his duties as a doctor. And everyone knew him as Stan the Doctor without knowing the man behind the Doctor, the heroics that he did. And we don't know much about him compared to his father because he was so modest. He talked about his father's achievements, quite rightly, but never his own. That wasn't right. So when I give my lecture, we spend at least 20 minutes to half an hour talking about him because um, dead Polish soldiers can't speak, so I need to do the speaking. Your ancestors yeah. were remarkable people, and I, I don't mean it as a cheap um, a compliment. Um, lots of uh, soldiers who ended up in Great Britain had to be remarkable, uh, and uh, their experience um, and their dreams made them so. But I was wondering what um, lessons did you learn from personal lessons from uh, uh, your great grand grandfather and, and uh, grandfather? Well, I hope we've got time because there are so many. Um, so the general uh, died when I was two. And um, so I, 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 there's pictures of him and me, but I was a, a little baby. Um, the lesson I learned from him was about dealing with injustice because he, of course, could not go back to Poland, he would have been executed or imprisoned. In fact, Jerzy Dierda, his adjutant, did go back to Poland, he did nine years in prison, because of course they couldn't have a ready-made fifth column in, in, um, in, in Poland. He had no pension and very unkindly, the British made no provision for his pension. He was demoted from the gen being the leader of the Barahu Brigade by Montgomery Browning, uh, and it's assigned to being the inspector of salvage and disposal. So he was he resigned his commission. Uh, he he was not a businessman. He tried to be a businessman. He failed. He ended up as a storeman in a factory in Acton, CAV Electronics. Can you imagine? Uh, you know, someone's got to be a storeman, but a, you know, a general, a one star general. And during the week, he was stand the storeman, and at weekends, he was General Sosabowski going to the clubs. And being a patriot, he didn't want to be a British citizen. He was here because he had to be. He wanted to go back to Poland. And how did he deal with that injustice? And in one of his books, I can't remember which one it was, he wrote, my life was tough and fallow. Um, and there were many difficult times. But if I was asked to repeat it, I would not hesitate to do that. Even though he ended up being poor and not having much money, he just said, you know what, I did the right thing. And uh, above all else, he was a hero of the Polish community. And also many of his soldiers worked in that same factory and they'd go to the storeroom and they'd snap to attention and salute before they asked for a, a bag of nails or bolts. But it's not unlike General Maciek, who ended up in Edinburgh uh, as a barman. You know, what was what behaviour was this? You know, someone's got to be a barman, someone's got to be a storeman, but not a heroic Polish general. So... And he died without without ever seeing any form of justice. I mean, the Dutch he used to go back to Holland and the Dutch um, named the street after him. But only after he died did he get the bronze lion, order of the bronze lion from the Dutch government. And he got, of course, uh, the order of the white eagle. About five years ago, I was asked to go and collect this decoration from President Duda, which I did with pleasure with my children. Also, I'm very happy about this. Um, but of course, he didn't know this. But he didn't, I don't think he was, he died angry because he said, I did the right thing. I did, I, we fought, we spilt Polish blood on Dutch soil, even though they were told they'd be liberating Warsaw. So 98 Polish boys died under his command in Arnhem. So he did the right thing. And the major, let me talk about him. The major broke his neck when he was a boy. He lost one eye to cancer. He lost another eye to a bullet of a sniper. And he said to me, Prof, um, I was lucky it was a explosive bullet, not an armor piercing bullet, because that would have gone through my head. Who on earth says I'm lucky to get shot in the face by this bullet and not that bullet? Dr. Major S.J. Sosabowski, that's who. And so he turned into a gentle old man. George Orwell said war makes monsters of us all. Didn't make a monster out of him. He died at peace with himself, but he had a conscience because only when he was old and I was, you know, a young man, 30, he started talking about the lives he had to take. And he said, I still think about it. And it's that kind of thing that young people like us, you're younger than me, of course, but 
people of our generation, the debt we owe to those soldiers. It's not just the terrible horrors of war at the time. It's the fact they have to live with those horrors till the day they die. You talked about young German boys, conscripts he had to kill as part of his duty. That was his duty, but it's an unpleasant duty. And so the debt we can never pay. You and I, young people, we can't pay it, which is why we have to keep having these conversations. Those are the lessons from those men. Absolutely, I agree with you. This is what I, uh, what is our duty, as you often say, uh, a pleasure, probably first. Yeah, as, pleasure, uh, of course. Yeah, yeah. But those, no, those, and I. The thing is, I get criticised on on the, the in social media, often by polls uh, that I don't speak Polish, and I'm very sorry. I've got my dummy's guide to Polish. I'm telling you, I'm reading it. Okay, but also, you know, this guy is trying to make a name for himself. I'm not. I don't need to make a name for myself. I've already got my name in a different field. It's my duty, because of my surname, to make this report to people who are going to listen. So if anyone wants to listen, I'll give this lecture, because I'm in a unique position to do that. It's a personal lecture. So I'm the reporter. These are not my achievements. Of course they're not. They're their achievements, but I am their ambassador. They can't talk, so I will talk for them. And when I can't talk, my kids will talk for them. And that will go on for, I hope, another 20 generations. Um, I have to tell you that um, I, I try, I'm trying to imagine uh, myself being in your shoes, and I would probably think and do the same. And I can I can speak for my friends, lots of them uh, interested in the in the history of Poland. They would be, uh, um, you know, as happy as as it gets to do the same. Uh, but uh, on a more general level. Why do you think, or how would you explain this um, um, lecturing about a war that ended uh, over 80 years ago? Why do you think it is, is it is important? Because it's unfinished business. They're not just my great-grandfather or my grandfather, but all the Poles. They, they couldn't, there was very limited Polish presence at the Victory Day Parade. And almost immediately, the, law, the, the war finished. The Poles were being edged out because, you know, Stalin didn't want, you know, it was this whole thing. And um, don't forget that um, when Tertian last year made the film of God, God Bless Montgomery, the, the Forgotten Poles of Arnhem, we found the cipher from Montgomery saying that the Poles were not keen to fight, even if it, if it meant risking their own lives. What a disgraceful scandal thing to say, because don't forget, the Poles covered the withdrawal of the British during Operation Berlin at the end of Arnhem. The Poles were the last to leave and 98 Poles were killed, you know, defending a country that wasn't their own, which they did with a good heart, even though they were told they'd be defending Warsaw. And that cipher has never been withdrawn. The, the you know, the, the, uh, the Dutch have created... Um, the heroism of the brigade. The brigade has the Willems Order, which is currently with the um, the, the sixth uh, the sixth brigade. Quite rightly, uh, the Poles, although my great grandfather's name never really needed rehabilitation, but there was the communist Poland and then the non-communist Poland, and he was once again celebrated. But the president Duda gave him the Order of the White Eagle, the highest decoration, bar none, as a note of his heroism. So you know. True heroes don't care about medals, you know. Mm. All we want is that disgraceful cipher to be withdrawn. The Poles did fight bravely. Their own lives or not their own lives. They fought as to the best of their ability, even though their equipment was dropped north, they were dropped south. They were crossing that river, that dirty, filthy river in rubber boats. And Captain Zwolanski was swimming the Rhine. The cold, filthy black Rhine in the night must have been terrifying. And yet those words were said that the Poles were not fighting if it meant risking their own lives. Lives. Lies, lies, lies. Let's correct it. Have the have the sense of British fair play. No medal, no, nothing. Just withdraw the cipher. Another cipher saying we withdraw the first cipher. We can only be but grateful for uh, your stance and, uh, and the fact that uh, you just... Uh... You give justice to, uh, as you say, to the people who cannot speak anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so how can people, I imagine there are uh, more than me, um, 
people who want to would like to help you in commemorating uh, your uh, great ancestors and our great ancestors i should say probably um how can we help you well i mean it seems to be this in the, this goes in waves um i give this lecture it's two hours long it's a, it's a long lecture to listen about the polish uh independent the first polish independent parachute brigade and my great grandfather his his youth and an operation market garden the polls at market garden and then a very um, personal reflection on the general and the major and i talk to anyone that's going to listen so we had this recently where i saw you last at the ognisco center perfect yeah. um i'm going on friday to edinburgh the consulate there organizing a nice lovely celebration weekend where it all happened and the color party will come from the from the battalion and um i just like giving this lecture that's what i do but i just think we have a duty not to forget um we're not going to forget of course we're not, but the reality is there's still loose ends and unfinished business and justice needs to be done and every lie that is told creates a debt to the truth and we need to get in front of that and uh, ensure that um you know that this thing happens because i can't be, you know we complain about our cell phones not working or the train is cancelled or the, the aeroplane is late you know they went through hell absolute hell i mean let me tell you the story i've told you before but let me tell you again i used to do my shop shopping for the the major the blind major he lived at home and i said do you want to live in a with my with me no i'm a soldier i live on my own so i used to buy him tins and i said this is the tin of soup this is the tin of cat food don't mix up the soup and the cat food and look when i went one day he said guess what guess what he said it with a polish accent he said i think i had cat food for my lunch i said oh that's disgusting said, what did it taste like he said very good and i laughed just like you're laughing because it is funny yeah and i thought you probably mean that because in the in the sewers of warsaw mm. they would eat rats they would eat cats they had to and so we don't know what a tough life is you know we have our iphones and our ipads and our smart tvs and our electric cars we don't know the half of it that's why i just think you know if there's a soldier walking by you shake his hand and you buy him a cup of coffee and say thank you so what an inspiring story um i um, i have um, attended as i said um a few of your lectures especially the last one at uh, of this kopolski in, uh, in kensington london um and i enjoyed it you said it is two hours long but nobody cared i can tell you uh about those two hours and they were two hours well spent um so i know that you are willing to give such lectures all over uh the uk or even poland and i think um i if you allow me to do it i can uh, leave um in the description of the video a link or um or your uh, email address is it okay please do yes if someone wanted to invite you uh with the with the lecture you provide and and this is maybe one of the ways we can help you uh to give uh to in giving justice to our our actually common uh great heroes because they are not only polish heroes they they could be considered as uh, as um actually english heroes british heroes as well and uh, just great human beings yeah uh, i mean we, as you as you might recall we met in the home army museum in krakow and yes. so it does it works it, and i understand i do feel if for the benefit of the die hard poles a slum some guilt about not delivering it in polish but the reality is my mother was english that's a reason not an excuse but the reality is i mean it's full of pictures it works and um it's it's one of a kind and so i'm very happy to come to poland you know easy jet two hours we're there it happens let's us make it so yes uh hopefully uh we'll see uh each other and uh, soon our guest uh today was professor hal sabowski thank you very much for your time sir do widzenia dziękuję bardzo do zobaczenia